I guess it's uh, time for a new podcast. What's up, everyone? Welcome into Drum Candy. This is your host, Mike Dawson, and we are here at Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this show is all about drum gear, drum sounds. We're going to be exploring, we're going to be rebuilding drums, we're going to be deconstructing drums, we're going to be testing, A-B testing hoops and heads and wires and everything imaginable. So first things first, I want you, the listener, to be involved in the show. So if you have any topics or any questions or any curiosities you want me to explore on this show, email me, Mike, M-I-K-E, at drumfactorydirect.com, and we will put it into the queue. I'm calling the first season my first snare drum, and I'm going to be calling up a bunch of my uh, old buddies, some of my favorite drummers, and some of my um, my biggest um, influences in drum sounds. So we're going to be picking our brains, and I want to find out what their first snare drum was, what's their ideal snare drum sound, and most importantly, what would they do to fix up this junky, I say that in the most lovingly way, this junky five and a half by, or maybe it's a five by 14 steel shell. I believe it's a pearl imprint drum. In all likelihood, it's my first snare drum from most of us out there. So I'm gonna be asking each one of them what they would do with this drum. And I'm gonna be trying their suggestions. And then we're gonna have a little shootout of everyone's suggestions. And hopefully by the end of the season, we will have this drum tricked out to where you could take it on the road, take it to a session. It won't fall apart. It's gonna sound great. We'll see what happens. First, we're going to debut the show with a good buddy of mine, Carter McLean, the, um, coming up on his 10th year as the drummer for Lion King on Broadway. Carter's great, incredible, incredible touch, really knows about sound and tuning, has his own approach to everything. He's never, never sounded bad, in my opinion, on anything, so I'm excited to pick his brain just about sounds, just to get caught up. Um, so anyway, without further ado, let's dig in with Mr. Carter McLean. Check it out. Rhythm is all around us. Carter McLean, welcome to the show. How you doing? Sir, thank you for having me. I'm honored. <laughs> so anyone listening doesn't know, Carter's had the Chariot Lion King for many years at this point, almost a decade, I think. How many years has it been? It's 10 years, 10 years that I've had the chair this year, yeah. 10 years that you've had the chair, and then first time in the history of the show that it went dark for a year, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the last time I remember something like this even remotely happening was when 9-11 happened. Um, right. And it only shut for a couple of days, basically, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was looking at the calendar. So anyone, again, listening doesn't know, you invited me to learn the book about two years ago, which is, was amazing. So I was subbing for you pretty regularly, and I looked at my calendar, and the last show I did was March 11th. I think I did the last matinee, and then you did Wednesday, Thursday, and then that was it. Of last year, yeah, I I remember playing. Well, I think I played on the eleventh. Was there a show that night? I think so. I did the afternoon because you texted me that night and said, "Hey, moving forward, bring your own sticks." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, because you hit like an animal. That's why. No, because of COVID. You. <laughs> oh, did I? Yeah. That's well. Oh no, because I remember. Uh, I remember going in on the train that night and seeing a lot more people with masks on and. I had already canceled a tour I was supposed to do with Ludwig in Asia in February. Mm -hmm. It was like the end of February, and I saw everything going on over there, and I said, look, I'm not comfortable going. I think we should postpone this. And I was thinking, postpone it for a few months or whatever. Um, and then that night, I remember saying, because I was kind of getting a little freaked out by the city and what I was hearing, and that night was the last show. It closed the next morning. And I remember on the way home before they closed it, I told my wife, I said, hey, I think I'm going to take a week or two off and just kind of <laughs> stay home. And she was like, yeah, that could be cool. That's maybe smart. And then they were like, got an email late that night saying, you know, the show is closed for the next two weeks. Little did we know right. that was going to be a year and a half later. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, yeah. So Thursday, there was no show. So yeah, I played the matinee, you played the night show, and that was it. Yeah, man. You Done. were my last sub in, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Which is crazy. So is there any news on that front? Yeah, I just had a, a Zoom meeting with the Disney theatrical people. You know, it was one of these Zoom meetings with 180 people in the room. It was like, and it, they actually went really, they, they went really well. They're like, everybody 
mute your microphone right now. And there was like one person talking. They they basically said rehearsals are starting August 23rd. That'll be three weeks of rehearsing. You know, it's mostly for the dancers and the singers to get back in shape. I mean, I could probably go back in with the orchestra and, you know, do two passes and get it pretty much tight. But yeah. it's really for the dancers and all of that choreography to get back in their bodies. So I don't know if I'm going to have to be there for all the rehearsals. And then they said officially uh, the show is going to start mid-September, like September 14th, somewhere in there. And t- tickets are actually going on sale tomorrow for all that. What's the date? Which is, so it would be uh, May 7th would be the uh, day that tickets are going on sale. So are you, like, excited to get back? I mean, is it, <laughs> are you like, what, what, how do I do this? What is this life I used to have? <laughs> it really, I mean, it's crazy, man. I mean, I, I've been playing that show for 20 years, you know, so I subbed yeah. for 10 years. And, yeah. And so it's just a, you know, I was a kid. I was like 20 three i think or something when i started there so it's been like my whole life um Mm -hmm. i mean i toured and did a bunch of other things but it's just been this constant thing when i'm not out doing other things i would be subbing on the show and so it was very weird to get that email and then realize that this show is going to be closed for a while like the light switch just was turned off that night which was just Mm -hmm. such a weird thing there was no warning it was just like hey we're closed um I, I mean, you know, I miss some of the people there that I got to see every day. They're good friends. And, you yeah. know, just having to play, you know, the show is a little demanding mentally, I think. Yeah. So just having that is almost like your daily, like, checkup almost, you know, to make sure you are still got your act together was kind of a nice mm-hmm. thing. I haven't played any of those songs since, you know, I'm not like. Have you played three hours in a row since? No. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I have. I mean, I did. I redid my whole website and everything, so that was just days of tracking and editing and, and recording and stuff. But I haven't played that much since then, though. No. Just like sitting down and playing. So yeah, that's going to be weird. To you know, it, it was crazy because I felt like my chops were finally just ready to play the show, and then it's over. Because by the end of that, seriously, by the end of the bows, I am spent, man. It's like, get me out of here. I need an ice bath. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, there's like you know, yeah, the finale is a lot going on. Like you just have to be in it for those whatever eight, twelve minutes. It just keeps constantly going. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm excited to get back. I, it's been a very productive year, which has been great. Like I was kind of shocked when I look back at like I did four records. I relaunched my yeah. entire website. I've done a ton of like business moves that I've switched and teaching like more than I ever have. So it's been a very busy year considering I don't quote unquote have a job. Um, right. Yeah. You probably win the award for the most productive unemployed <laughs> drummer of the year. <laughs> Man, that's the goal. I think I just get bored easily. It's like, I, well, I can walk my dog so many times and yeah. practice piano so much. And then it's like, all right, let's do, let's do some drum stuff. So it's been cool, but I'm excited to get back and play and see everybody. So before we dive into the topic at hand, which is snare drums, um, by the way, did you ever rescue the the brass drum out of the show, or is it still there? It's right there. You can see it. Yep. I I went in and got it. That was also bizarre. Going in after the show had been closed for almost a year and going to the theater. I just happened to call one day when there was someone like cleaning or doing something at the theater, and they let me in. And I saw Jose, the door guy, who I hadn't seen in over a year. And I was like, Jose, mm. what's up? It was, felt so good to see him and be in the theater, <laughs> even though there was nobody there. Um, but, yeah. I, and everything was exactly how I left it in my room. My in-ears were exactly where I put them. The refrigerator was still on. Uh, <laughs> no food in it, I hope. <laughs> no, it was just drinks and stuff. But it was like, wow, it was like a time capsule. It was so bizarre. So I grabbed a couple, like, my mantra ride and the... That brass snare, which I love, which I don't know if that's going to go back. I love it here. Um, mm. I'll see what I pick. We'll, we'll talk about snare drum selection maybe for the show. <laughs> nice. So uh, quickly about your records. How can people find them? You put out two solo, quote-unquote, solo drum records this year. Yeah. Right? Yeah, two of those, and then I did two with Charlie Hunter. Um, mm. One of those was really early on. All that stuff you can find at my website, cartermclean.com. So I have all the records I've done there. 
Um, you can link to my sticks and any kind of quote unquote merch I have is at the site now. It's just all condensed. As well as like your educational course. It's all on the site. Oh yeah. Site. Yeah. All that stuff is there. Um, so yeah, did, did uh, a, a full on solo drum record when this started. I was like, well, now's the time people have been wanting me to do this. So I, I got how all long the... did that take? Cause that, that's one of those things where I think it could take months or you could have done it in an afternoon. Yeah, I did it in probably, I don't know. A week or something like that it's, okay it's hard i mean it's it's mostly was about getting the right sounds like i didn't want to just do a drum record and set up a kit and just like rip like that to mm -hmm. me is not that's boring after one song i mean i started off actually the first track is on this kit behind me that red sparkle club date kit mm -hmm. from the late 60s and just had it kind of tuned like kind of like an adrice kind of a vibe and just hit record and played an open solo. And I was like, that's kind of fun. Like, that feels good. And then I built off of that idea. And then it slowly became like an art, not an art project, but it was like, all right, let's, how many different drum sounds can I get with all these different kits and different ideas and mm. just the path it would lead you down setting up, you know, you do this stuff all the time. It's like setting up a crazy setup and just seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started overdubbing like vocal samples of influential drummers and, people that I really respected and little quotes from people and I kind of tweaked their voices so you can't really tell who's who. Um, and that was really fun. It kept my brain occupied while the entire planet was falling apart, you know? Yeah, no kidding. So that started at the core, a kit with a unique sound that inspired you to improvise a certain way or were there any groove ideas before beforehand? No, I mean, all of that stuff was pretty much just improvised, it, you know? Okay. Like I'd set up my big WFL kit, like wide open, kind of a Bonham kind of big sound and i would it triggered me into this uh like tom waits kind of zone for some reason mm. um and then i started putting all this weird kind of metal sounding machine objects in the background and i just kind of did it almost like a daily exercise you know like all right today's kit's gonna be this one with like really punchy dead funky drums and that would lead me down a path um and were there any outtakes I don't think so. I think if I didn't like the take, I would just scrap it and start over. Yeah. I, I'm not good at like keeping like, here's alternate take one. I just go, you're gone, and I'll start over. <laughs> I'm, I'm so really... one thing per kit, not multiple? What do you mean? Like, did you just do one idea for that kit, and then when it's cool, or did you do multiple ideas per kit? No, it's a lot of every kit. So every track was a different setup. Um, nice. Which was really fun. I, I mean... I hit Command Z a lot and just deleted a lot of tracks, you know, because yeah. I wanted it to be. I, I, I hate when people piece things together. I feel like you really lose the flow of that moment. So everything is one take, you know, every song or mm. whatever drum piece, whatever. I mean, it's a weird thing to talk. I guess it's it's like a drum experience. <laughs> yeah. And even if you're not a drummer, some of this stuff is fun to just listen to as like a sonic because I think the drums sound really great on all of it. Um, yeah. Now, what about the second record? That seemed a little bit more conceptual. Yeah, that was an experiment. So I, I did the kind of solo -y drum thing, and then Charlie Hunter was like, man, let's do a groove record, like, remotely. And I was like, okay. So we did that in literally a day. Mm. I, I played some grooves I liked to a click, like five tracks or something, send them to Charlie. He'd play on top of it. Then he played five little things to a click, sent it to me. And we just overlapped on them and tracked to each other, nice. which was, you know, it's obviously you lose that live interaction, but it's better than nothing, man, when the planet's locked up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then we did a loop uh, thing. And then and then I was like, all right, I feel, feel like I'm ready to do something else. And I did as an exercise every morning I'd come down into the studio and sit in front of this little micro two octave keyboard, like teeny. It's like the it's mm -hmm. like a little bigger than your keyboard on a Mac or something, like little baby keys. And I started finding all these really amazing sounds within uh, the Luna program I'm working with from this company called Spitfire Audio. And some of them were like clarinet samples that sounded incredibly real. And mm. then some of them were string like quartet sounds. And so it started kind of messing with my ear in a different way. So the, I made an exercise out of it. I said I'm going to do a record in a week 
and just do a song a day and use it as an exercise for like letting go of all the micromanaging people do in recording these days where they're like, oh, the drum track has to be perfect and this has to be mm. quantized. And so I just said, I'm going to try to bang out a song a day. And I would sit down here with a cup of coffee and play a melody. And whatever the first melody I played on the keyboard is what I went with. So I just mm. made that a rule because otherwise you'll just noodle all day. Mm hmm. And that's how it started. And at the end of the day, I, I went to go pick up my wife at the train, and I was like, this is what I did today. And she was like, this sounds ridiculous. You did this all today? <laughs> I mean, it was like full drums, keyboards, samples, like bass parts. Everything was done. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do a record this week. And she's like, Jesus, okay. <laughs> and Unemployment suits you well, Carter. <laughs> I, look, man, i got to stay busy doing something or I'll go crazy. <laughs> And that's how that came about. And I think it's a really cool record. It, it reminds me of like kind of like Tribe Called Quest vibe without the MC. Uh, yeah. Some of it's like kind of very orchestral sounding, but with groove behind it. It was fun, man. I'm going to do another one that led me down this road. Arturia just sent me a great 88 key weighted keyboard that's like legit. Mm. And it actually comes with these amazing sounds already with the keyboard that you upload on this website it's got mellotrons it's got like all these old modular synths that are epic sounding mm -hmm. so i'm gonna do a new we'll see i mean I, my my wife's like you need to recharge at some point like you need to just chill <laughs> so well, that's when the show kicks in <laughs> i know exactly but i i'd like to start working on another record that's more like orchestral and ambient than just like groove based oh and I'll honestly probably end up throwing drums on everything anyway because I'll be like, oh, this would be dope with this kind of sound. I mean, do you remember Omar Hakim's solo record? No. From like the early 90s. It was like smooth pop. Oh, I, I should even know check it out. I drums on it. <laughs> it like, really? Whoa. He went against the grain of what everyone would want or expect from one of the greatest drummers of all time. Oh, I got to check that out. I haven't, I haven't heard about that. Yeah, I mean, my 12-year-old mind was very frustrated, but I looking back, I'm like, that was pretty pretty baller to make that move. Like, sure. he's singing on it. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, I'm gonna, that's the first thing I'm going to go check out when we're done. Oh, man. All right, so everyone, check out all of Carter's stuff, cartermclean.com. I'm sure you'll be updating it with a new record soon. <laughs> um, and check out all of his educational stuff. Um, I can't believe you cranked all that stuff out during the pandemic. It's, it's impressive. And also, don't forget about the book that, that is still doing well for you. Well, and thank you for transcribing everything, because that's not my forte. That, you crushed that. That was, that was a blast. It was, it was, Carter would send me a video, hey, what's, what's this look like? And I'd bang it out. I'm like, this is what it looks like, but I can't do it. So. <laughs> you can play. You can play all that stuff. <laughs> Heck no. That was all right, let's talk about snare. That was fun, though. I appreciate you doing that. That's literally how that book came about. I'd be working on an idea, and I'd be like, oh, let me videotape this and send it. And, dude, you were a ninja with that. You'd get it back to me in, like, five minutes, perfectly written out. I was like, look at this guy go. Yeah, I can be a nerd. I just can't play it. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, the book is great. So thanks. Call me the drumming secretary. <laughs> Oh. All right, snare drums. First of all, what was your first snare drum? Oh, man. No one's ever asked me that. That's cool. That's it's a pretty cr I was thinking about my own today. I was like, whoa, what I thought was my first snare drum was not my first snare drum. I, I know what my first snare my first. drum was. Uh, all right, because, what was it? And I remember it really clearly. I, it was a Pearl. It's before the export series was even a thing. So it was probably like a mid-70s. I bet it was a steel pearl uh, snare that was like a five and a half and i remember specifically it had a it look like this one? Oh my god <laughs> that is so crazy dude that's the that's it that is insane you just pulled that out and i was gonna say it it had these like kind of like ribs going around the at the side of it yeah this is it they Holy. made it all they made these things for everybody so this one is not a pearl this is called gig Percussion. <laughs> oh, even better. Even better. That's a limited edition one I heard. Yeah, so before you go on, the whole premise of this podcast for this season is I'm going to take this junky drum and try to hot rod it. Yeah, love so this. So we're going to see what happens with, we'll dig into that more, but because it's, it's a cool drum, it's just nothing I would ever take out of the house. Yeah, it needs a little <laughs> love. But I remember, it's, dude, that just blew my mind. You just pulled that into the frame. That is crazy. <laughs> but I remember that drum specifically because, and I remember the kit too. 
Uh, it had a blue, it almost looked like a blue hydraulic clear head, but it had a silver dot in the center, which I, I can't, kn- I don't know what that would be. Oof. Bizarre. I don't know. I mean, uh, it was did based, Ludwig do a blue? Could huh? have been a Ludwig thing, but it definitely was like a clear, heavy head with a silver dot in the center, and that was my first snare. I remember learning Appetite for Destruction on that snare drum. <laughs> Perfect. Doom, da, doom, da, doom, da. Got my Paradise Do you still have it? I'm no, really man, I wish. I sold that thing, like, so quickly. I was like, get this out of my life. This is a piece of garbage. I wish I had it. The, and the kit was cool. It was, a, it was a bass drum and a tom, no floor tom, and it was almost this, like, pearl essence. It was almost like a flat color, but it was, like, a kind of a pearl color, and it was a pearl kit. It was a 22 and a 12 rack tom, but it was a concert tom with no bottom lugs. Weird, dude. It probably was a badass kit, but... I guess they saved a couple bucks not putting a hoop on the bottom. (laughs) I guess. But that was the kit, man. That's what I I had that and a set of hi hats and no ride. Kind of kind of similar to my kit now, basically. (laughs) Yeah, full circle. Full circle. (laughs) It's the circle of life, Mike. (laughs) So let's talk about what do you look for in a snare drum today? Oh man. Well, and then piggybacking, what's the first thing that you do when you try out a drum? Like, what's your ritual? I only have, like, two snare drums. <laughs> so, uh, all right. The th- I won't show you my wall. <laughs> oh, dude, I don't even want to know how many snare drums you have. Um, so what I look for in a snare drum, like, what I personally like today is I don't have a preference between metal or wood. Some people are, like, lean one way or the other. I just like something that's got a nice range. I don't typically crank my snares super tight. I feel like they, do, at a certain point, don't sound good. You know, they just get mm. all the vibe of the snare gets tuned out of it. And then they all just kind of sound the same to me. But um, I tune my snares mostly like medium, medium low, I'd say for most people. And I'm looking for something that's got a nice presence to it, but it's also warm and also mm-hmm. has like a good crack obviously for backbeats so like one of my favorites that i have as a modern drum is the copper phonic from ludwig Mm -hmm. just because it's got all of those characteristics and metal tends to take a little bit of that to the next level than wood because you get all these other harmonics and stuff that just wood doesn't have um so that's a great drum and then as far as wood drums I mean, man, I ha- most of my wood drums are old. I have a couple yeah. newer ones. Like, I have a Jazz Fest reissue that's really nice. Um, and then I have a Club Date snare, a six and a half inch Club Date. I think it's maple, seven ply maple, poplar maple with rounded edges. Mm. And that drum crushes. That thing records so well. Um, but in I general. Mean, if, if your studio was going to blow up in five minutes, geez. what would be the one drum you would drive? You can't you would grab and. <laughs> you can't say that this year, man. <laughs> <laughs> gotta, gotta keep it positive. Um, uh, uh, if I had to grab one drum, well, I could grab two, right? Because I got two hands. Sure, I'll give you that. Yes, thank you. Um, I would grab a Craviato snare that Johnny gave me as a gift. That was just like a really special, just a really cool thing that he did when I was a kid. I met him nice. at a NAMM show. I think I was 19. And I was checking out, uh, it was a solid walnut five and a half with two lugs. And I remember going over to it. I, I didn't know who he was. I had never played his drums and was blown away by it, how it sounded. It was incredible. And long story short, he got my address from someone at DW and like nine months later sent that drum to my house as a gift, which mm. was yeah, what a sweetheart. It's so incredible. And I called him. I said, dude, I can't afford this drum. I, it, literally, I didn't ask for one, nothing. And I said, I can't, you know, it's like a $1,200 drum. And he said, no, 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 man, that's a gift for you. That's from me to you. It's a gift. I love your playing. I was like, dude, you know, such a nice Mm. guy. So I would grab that one, and I would grab this basically museum grade. It's like a 19, I think it's like a late 20s. It's a six and a half by 14 uh, mahogany with two lugs, claw hoops, all original nickel hardware. It's in like immaculate shape. Came with the original case, the original rosewood sticks, the snare drum stand. Like, mm. it's such a an amazing time capsule. And 
I, like I bought that was the most expensive snare I've ever purchased, and luckily the guy was on the East Coast, so I drove out and we met halfway, and um, the guy got it from the original owner who had it his whole life, and it just went under his bed in a, in a box, and it was just in nuts. Per, original calf heads on it, top and bottom. That drum is like that's coming to the grave with me, or somebody's Does gonna it get, sound I'm, good. It sounds dope. I put real. I, I changed the heads out and put on uh, newer heads. I, I play with it. I mean, I'm not wailing on it, but I'm. You know, mm-hmm. I can play like a medium, you know, mezzo forte groove on it, and it sounds amazing. Because it's all mahogany, and the wood is like super obviously dried out from you know a hundred year old drum. Yeah, it's pretty dope. Yeah, that makes sense that you would grab something that couldn't be replaced my instinct would be grab something i can play on every gig but you could just go to the store and buy a new yeah one. i'll just order a new one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> smart that's why you're smarter than me <laughs> <laughs> i'm just sentimental about these things i don't know but so, every drum i have here is like i could grab and make it sound the way i want you know which is what i wanted to kind of wrap it up with like um if you're playing a backline kit or something, what, what do you do to the snare to kind of get it in your zone? What's the what's the steps? Depends on the gig. All right, let's go like worst case scenario. I get to a gig, it's a Charlie Hunter duo, because and during that show, I tune the snare completely differently from song to song. Um, mm. Let's say there's like a bell brass Tama snare there, which is mm-hmm. not the right snare for that gig. Um, if everybody knows, that's like a heavy duty rock backbeat cannon yeah. tank. Um, <laughs> Fortissimo only. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I would probably, I'm guessing the head would be cranked on it. I would probably immediately take my wallet and put the wallet on the top head. I'd probably detune the whole head, like one full turn down to like medium, mm. medium low. Probably tune the snares medium loose. I'd, that's one thing that affects the sound of a drum dramatically that a lot of people don't mess with is the tension of the snares. Like Most mm-hmm. people have them super tight so much so that the drum kind of chokes out if you play around with that for everybody listening at home just leave your drum the way it is and tune it really tight with the snares and then back it off while you're tapping it and you'll hear the tone of the drum start to open up and start to breathe um so that's really important the snare tension but and bottom snare head i always tune pretty tight like Mm -hmm. you know i i go around with my thumb and if i can push down and feel it, that's too loose for me. It needs to feel pretty tight. Mm. That's just me. I'm probably wrong so, with that approach. But What do you mean by medium or medium loose? Is there like a number of turns? Is it a feel thing? For the Is head? note? Yeah, for the batter head. Uh, yeah, for me, it's like if you can push in the center of the head and the head moves down, you know, a decent amount, like that's kind of medium loose to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I could give you a pitch probably with a drum. Yeah, let's do it. You're in a room full of drums. Yeah, let me grab. (laughs) What is he going to grab? What do we got? Oh, that's low. All right, this I had tuned super dead for a session the other day. Uh, This I would consider, like, low. Yeah, that's, like, almost distorting low. Yeah, so my version of like low, I think, is more than most. Yeah. But the bottom head is this. Yeah. You know, so I don't change that. Um, sorry, I don't change that depending on how loose or tight the top head is. The bottom head just stays. So. And then, you know, between tape and a towel or a wallet or whatever, you could put anything on there put a book um put your phone (laughs) just don't hit your phone it changes the the vibe immediately or just detuning one lug completely will just totally take out the harmonic of the head and just give you this splat very quickly but so the moral of the story is experiment don't be precious about it absolutely some of the best snare sounds i've ever gotten were were like the top head is not tuned equally at all like, mm-hmm. you know, I just kind of tweaked it quickly, hit it, and was like, boom, that's it. Don't mess with anything. You got to just use your ear. You know, there's, I, I feel like there's just too many, this is how you tune a snare drum kind of things. Yeah. And it's cool if you're really have never tuned a drum in your life. Yeah, like go through all that stuff. But at a certain point, like they say, you got to learn all the rules before you just throw them out the window. 
So this sound that you're describing for you at home and for when you're gigging is very different from what the show requires. So what are you going to be using? <laughs> oh, at Lion King. To the show? Yeah, because I think of Lion King snare as being quite tight and the wires are quite tight. Yep. Yeah, so again, it's like application, you know? So yeah. every session is different. And that show in particular is basically Elton John pop tunes with like an African flavor thrown on top of it right so mm -hmm. it's like i had that raw brass drum in there for the last couple of years which is yep. i thought was a perfect drum there it had die cast hoops and had the head pretty tight you know to the point of mm -hmm. like it's like a funk snare almost mm -hmm. and you know some tape on it so they don't the sound engineers wanted them dead like all the toms had tape all over them um mm -hmm. basically like a, a pop kit sound for for the most part um but I love that snare now. I've been using it on some yeah, recording. Yeah, so what are you going to take into the theater? I, I might, well, I like the uh, the LM402 as well, but I might bring that in just to give that thing a little more love. Um, that's, for anyone listening, that's the classic uh, John Bonham Superphonic, right? Yeah. And but you don't have the wide wires on it. You have regular wires? I have Canopus. I just started using the Canopus stuff, and I have Canopus um, vintage wires on it, and it sounds ridiculous. It's really... I mean, it's tough. You know, I have like 20 something drums and they're all, they all have a thing they do really well. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, the brass one, I don't know. It's a, it's great, but it'd be fun, maybe, you know, different. We've had a long break. Maybe it's time to take the Superphonic in. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, yeah. You can't go wrong with that drum. <laughs> for yeah. For sure. It'll be fun. And when you play it, when you come back and sub for me, you'll be like, oh, this is good. Good, good call. <laughs> good call. I mean, that's my. The drum that I got in high school, I rescued out of a dumpster and put it together. It was a 70s 6 nat by 14 Superphonic. Oh, nice. I paid nothing for it because I used junkie. I used trash hoops, trash throw-off, trash shell. I put heads on it and wires on it, and I think I stole the wires from an old junkie drum. Love it. I've used that drum on more sessions than anything I've paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars for. You still have That'll it. That'll be the one I get buried with, and it's, it is it is garbage <laughs> it was garbage and it is garbage it still is but it sounds like a million bucks <laughs> which makes me nervous about i mean this drum doesn't sound great this this pearl thing i'm shocked it looks beautiful but i'm, I'm kind of <laughs> nervous about deconstructing it and then getting to the end of this season and being like you know what the drum sounded better with all the garbage on it. that will be interesting to see like what it came with and just how it sat if it changes dramatically, are you going to change the where lugs? Where would you start? That's, where, where would you start? Yeah, I'm going to do everything. Hoops. We're going to try die cast, brass hoops, single flange. We're going to do all the different kinds of heads. How heavy gonna... is it? Would you say it's light? It's just a like standard, standard weight. thin steel welded shell that everyone got in the early '90s and late '80s. Man, I would I would replace the throw off. I would leave the hoops. And I would just put new snares and new heads on it. The throw off, right? That's usually the one thing that, that makes or breaks a drum's function. Yeah, and it's also just like, you know, I love, there's a Ludwig one. I think it's called the P87. It's like a kind of a flip towards the drum. Mm -hmm. That's like the most elegant, simple throw off. I, I have Ludwig every time. They just know, I'm like, look, if you send me a snare, that's the throw off it needs to have on it. And they just stopped asking, so that's what comes like. That's what's on my four O two, and it's it's just it looks awesome. It functions. You can adjust the snares really well. I would put that throw off on that drum. I would put mm. Canopus vintage wires on it, and I would yep. put a, a Genera three hundred snare side head, and I would probably put a just for general playing purposes. I'd probably put a UV one on the top, and it'd probably sound dope. All right, that's going to be my assignment. By the next time I talk to you, it's going to be the <laughs> Carter McLean tricked out uh, gig go. percussion. <laughs> Dude, that's going to be my new signature drum right there. <laughs> I might even gift it to you at the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> What's your address? I got a sweet little thing coming for you. Oh, man, that's funny. Here, here's a piece of garbage. That's so trippy, though, that that literally looks exactly like the first snare I ever played. It's cool. Yeah. I, I mean, that's why, so this isn't of my first snare, but it is a replica of my first snare. So I had to get it. What? My first snare I thought was an Acrolyte, but it wasn't. I had this <laughs> junky thing and then a really junky, like, 10-inch wood drum with the fan wires underneath the top head. Oh, wow. 
that was when I was like eight or nine. That was my first real drum. Oh Not a real gosh. drum. That was my first drum. <laughs> but it was garbage. The fan <laughs> wires. That, that'll make you work on your press roll. Oh, they would strip and pop off. Oh, I mean, out here I was nine years old trying to play Living Color Vivid. Yes. On this little three-piece junior kit. Oh, my God. With the splash symbols, the only symbol I had. <laughs> I wish I had a video of that. <laughs> oh, man. That was the first band I ever saw live on that tour, Vivid. They, yeah, we talked about that. I can't believe you saw them. They I opened. The, I listened to that record every day for probably six years. Dude. Will Calhoun, man, just I was like, that guy is doing something that I want to be doing. Um, yes. And then I first saw hero. them open up for the Rolling Stones at Yankee Stadium. That was my first concert experience. Can you believe that? And you wanted to walk out when the Stones came on, or what? I no, mean, I was. How did like, they not mop up the floor? Oh, dude, Keith Richards came out. Dang it. And fireworks went off. I was like, all right, this is what I want to do with my life. This looks way too cool. You know, it was at a stadium. That was my first show. That was my assumption. Like, oh, if I am in a band, I'll just be playing stadiums. This seems great. Yeah. Little Private did I jets know. And stadiums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I've got an assignment. I'm going to do the Carter McLean version of this crappy drum. And we'll. Dude, be careful. You'll have to come back on and, and assess. <laughs> I'm gonna. I haven't recorded it yet, so I'm gonna do a before, and then we'll do an after with with your suggestions. I love it. I can guarantee. I can give you my guarantee. It'll sound better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for uh, coming on the show. And if you're cool with it, I'm gonna bring you back on soon. Oh, of course, man. It'd be a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Go to CarterMcLean.com. Check out all this stuff, and then go um, go see Lion King in September. For God's sakes. Yes. Come feel the love. Now. Come feel the love. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks. <laughs> Rhythm is all around us. I almost forgot. We can't finish this episode without demoing what this snare drum sounds first without changing anything. So this is as I've had it for about 10 years. Uh, old Aquarian texture-coated head couple pieces of, of gaffer's tape that I put on it just to try to tame it in a little bit. It's got the original throw-off, which sort of works. The lugs are all there. Uh, so we're just going to check it out. This is our control. This is what does this drum sound like now. I'm just going to tune it, you know, medium, medium high, crank it, detune it all the way, pull the tape off so you can hear all the funkiness in the shell. So this gives us a reference point that we'll come back to later in, in, the, uh, in the season. Okay, check it out, and then we'll see you next week. My good buddy Mike Johnston is on next week's episode. So check it out. Go to drumfactorydirect.com. Um, search around. Find some of the things that Carter uh, suggested, the UV1s, the uh, 300 series bottom side head, pure sound vintage wires. It's all there. All right. See you next week. Mm -hmm.